Well, hello, everybody. Hi. Welcome to another uh, Zebra Central image breakdown. I see we've already got people in the chat talking it up. So thank you for being a part of that. We got a very special guest with us. I'm excited for you all to see what he'll be sharing. Uh, let's please welcome uh, our guest for today, uh, Giorgio uh, Palombi. Thanks for joining us. <laughs> That's you to invite me to this uh, wonderful uh, situation. And uh, thank you. Thank you again. I hope uh, to say something useful for the kids out there and uh, to be funny, at least <laughs> as a bit. I'm excited to have you. I know um, what you're going to be showing a lot of people. There's some great tips and tricks in, uh, in this one again for the piece that we're going to be breaking down with him. And as always, any questions that you may have as we're going along here, uh, throw them in the chat and we'll do our best to try and send as many as we can to Giorgio so that we can get those answered for you. But as always, we're not necessarily gonna be able to funnel every single thing to him. But if you do have something, by all means, please uh, feel free to put that in the chat and we'll go from there. So. Um, George, I'll let you take it from here. We'll put your screen up. So if you want to get your yeah. uh, your stuff ready and you can get going and show a little bit about yourself too. Yes. And then uh, we'll get connected. Yes, and again, we're going to be breaking down his Cthulhu child that he did that's on Zebra Central. Uh, another really awesome piece. Yeah. All right. Okay. Gonna, uh, add me, your Go ahead. Just tell me if you see something. Yeah, I'm going to add your screen now. Perfect. Uh, let me introduce me a little bit. Uh, my name is Giorgio Palumbi. I am a character artist, but I am working in the toy industry for about six years now. And uh, what I do is uh, sometimes a direction, sometimes through modeling, uh, sometimes, uh, you know, concept art, depending on the need of the, of the company. I'm uh, working in Italy. Uh, my company's name is uh, Giochi Preziosi. It's a big company, especially in Europe, uh, in South of Europe. Uh, it's pretty famous. And uh, we have uh, some kind of, uh, you know, IP, personal IP, and the rest is the distribution of toys from the world. And uh, just want to show you something for whom who that doesn't uh, know me at all. And this is my station page where you can find different kinds of uh, 3D art, also 2D art, because uh, I used to sketch a lot. Uh, this is uh, something I made from an Inktober using my Pendic. This is my favorite tool to explore shapes and concepts when I do something for myself, especially. And uh, many of these uh, are pretty unknown for rest of the world maybe because uh, many are Japanese uh, uh, interpretation I made from some uh, you know cartoons from the 70s so they was pretty famous in Italy some of them are famous in France maybe or uh, Saudi Arabia and uh, I used to do 3d modeling uh, based on this because I can improve the shapes and made it more uh, you know modern and um, keeping the emotion I, I felt when I was young. And um, yes, sometimes I made just for fun, sometimes made for some contest, sometimes for work, like this one is pure character art, uh, classic character art for gaming. And uh, sometimes I use this process also to find new, uh, new technologies to make me, you know, aware of something that uh, I cannot find while I work in uh, stable in the office. So I spent some time testing a uh, new ZBrush feature or uh, rendering feature, especially in this three example here, you can see me just trying to figure out uh, the feature of Marmoset toolbar and with vertex colors directly from ZBrush. And uh, in the same time, I was improving my texturing skills in, uh, in Substance uh, Painter. And uh, in the end of the process, I build uh, a new uh, workflow to follow when I have time. So I am more uh, you know, fast and free to develop uh, some ideas. 
and uh, the last one is Cthulhu, where it's uh, a resume of uh, everything I can say at the moment. It was really fast to do. And uh, let me show you now something that is my uh, actual work, daily basic work. Uh, working for uh, toy industries means working also on this kind of things, you know. And uh, since I'm uh, the, the senior organic model, uh, like we say here, I am uh, responsible also to make tweaks, uh, new dolls, uh, and everything related to organic modeling. So it could happen to work on simple dolls uh, or even more uh, funny project like this one. These are all the IPs from uh, Giorgio Preziosi that come from the past. So at the moment, we are just revamping the style. We, we just uh, doing new styles for these old designs uh, they did in, uh, I think, 20 years ago. Uh, they are collectibles. And this design was made by our concept art Department. This is from Valentino Biagetti, who is uh, also uh, becoming a 3D artist at the moment. Because you know, if you can draw, you have uh, a straight way to be an uh, organic modeler in ZBrush because it's a simple uh, way to, to do it. And uh, this is another example from the, the same concept from the same guy, uh, just modeled. Uh, some of them are uh, released, uh, some of them are discarded, but I just want to show you the differences between um, the variety, variety of, uh, of styles we have to face when we uh, try to get the thing done. And uh, this is another collection of my commissions because in the free time, sometimes people ask me for personal commission. Usually they are uh, Japanese uh, kind of style. Uh, things even uh, from the past, many of them are pretty new, maybe for some of, of you. But uh, here in Italy, they are very famous. So many people love to have uh, his own designs and 3D print stuff uh, and so on. And in this case, I will post it uh, uh, as soon as I have time on station two. It's one of the the one of um, the best I did uh, in the last time because it's uh, rendering uh, and uh, studying for uh, a statue in the same time. And uh, it was already bought from a company and maybe they will uh, produce them soon. This is public, so I already posted uh, around the social media, so it's not uh, NDA protected. And uh, yes, and another thing I did uh, and it's, it's a great project for me because I'm working on this project from uh, at least four years now. We did um, three seasons now of this uh, IP that is Gormiti. And it's an Italian IP coming from uh, 2005, I guess, I think. And we did a new design, uh, a new story, and uh, it's for kids, uh, of course. Uh, and uh, it was really cool because uh, I had the chance to be uh, art director and I put uh, ZBrush in the center of the production for this uh, project. Since uh, from ZBrush, uh, as you can see here, this is one of the many characters I have to do. And from the ZBrush character, we can um, we could uh, study the engineering process for the action figure. And in the same time, we have the model ready for um, for the actual toy and the cinematic version that was used by Kotok, that is an uh, animation uh, um, company in uh, Spain. It was responsible for the show, the TV show, all in CGI. CGI. So it, it was crucial to have uh, one single software that could be delivered uh, the same model used for many purposes. In um, oh, uh, yes, I use it also for the the cards. You know, 
there are many collectibles uh, on this kind of characters and every single uh, character has its own card. And if you see this card as a, a particular, uh, I have something more visible here. There is this style, there is painterly style, but it was actually from, uh, they comes from ZBrush directly because I used the Photoshop plugin present in the list of the ZBrush plugin that allows you to have uh, um, a multi-pass uh, file just ready to be manipulated in Photoshop. So using that, uh, I was able to have the same character in pose, like in the collectible version, ready to be painted uh, and uh, manipulated to gain some kind of uh, fancy illustration. So uh, it was uh, really funny and uh, uh, like you say, Something very, um, I don't know the word for epic, epic as, uh, I don't know why. It was straightforward, very, very easy to obtain everything with the same file. Uh, all right. And um, during this journey on uh, this particular uh, IP, uh, we decided to do some uh, redesign of uh, very old characters. They was already present in the, Toki Preciosi production. And this one in particular resembled very closely to Cthulhu. So when I had to redesign it, and this is the final result that is uh, now in, uh, in the stores, and I just uh, decided to do also the big version, the adult version of Cthulhu. So everything, uh, let's say, could be related uh, to this toy I had to model in my office time. So how old was the original? The original, how old was that? Is it like from like the 80s, the 90s, or is that only a couple this years old? This guy here from yeah. 2005, I guess. 2005. Like maybe even before. But uh, this version here, it was, the, it was the, um, the one we choose to be, you know, redesigned. But uh, yeah, very, quite old, I can say. And uh, yes, so after this, I just decided to do the, the one we are talking about. So to do that, uh, I, I really was a fan. I am a fan of uh, Lovecraft. Um, for whom who don't know the writer, I have here the Wikipedia page. So you can find it easily. And uh, he's a writer who made something incredible on the horror, sci-fi, and you know, fantasy uh, kind of writings. And uh, he built uh, uh, an incredible world full of monsters, ancient uh, gods, uh, and uh, things that now we can find in every video game or TV series when it comes to horror and fantasy kind of stuff. So it is a very important artist and uh, I really encourage you to, to try to read something from him. And uh, Cthulhu is one of the most famous creatures he made. And uh, so I started just uh, uh, looking for uh, um, uh, an image that I didn't know he made it. This is actually from him. And, uh, and uh, he just drew the Cthulhu monster, as he imagined, is uh, quite similar to the, the actual description he made in the short story. And uh, I found also someone who made, uh, of course, the statue and so on. And this is, was uh, interesting. And uh, I already know very well the shape uh, and the, the picture I have to do in this character, but uh, it was interesting to uh, to try to fix some points. Uh, the fact that he has to be humanoid, scaly skin, uh, a blobby, fatty skin somehow in the same time. He had to grab the pedestal because the pedestal was important because of the writing. This writing, I made it uh, uh, following what he said in the, in the book, but it's, this writing is translated uh, because it comes from a, a lost language from the past. 
and uh, basically he said that Tulu is dipping in a city uh, under the sea from eons, eons in time, but in the same time he's dreaming. He's dreaming, he it can, it could change the, the mind of the artist, of the sensible people. And uh, he was, you know, he's ready for uh, his uh, awakening. Awaken, I think uh, I said that. I hope. So I just tried to fix something that I have to keep in mind to make him believable and recognizable. And in the same time, I wanted it to be a bit different from what other artists did. So the next step, the next step was to get some images from internet from a lot of different artists, even I a uh, image production very recent. You know, now you can see million and million every five minutes of images like this. But any, I, I feel uh, very uh, inspired from some composition from the journey, for example. And this one in particular has, uh, I, I choose this one in particular to have uh, a sort of uh, key point in my mind to, to follow to the final render, even if it's completely different, but you know, it's something I can relate and it's important to have. So this is uh, the book, uh, the Kenyan version of the book I have here. I read it more than once. And I love also this uh, more, you know, hinky uh, combination of the face of Tulu. And from here, I think I get this central eye. And uh, yes, uh, other things you can find here is uh, another versions, for example, from other sculptors. And it's, it's very interesting how they uh, use it, the different surface detail to do something very unique. And uh, after that, uh, obviously, uh, I found something more related to octopus itself, since the head has to be very resembling an octopus. And I use this reference just to get some wrinkle movement, like here find something very similar I use it in the final version of my 3D sculpt. Also this membrane was really interesting because I didn't find it uh, used so much from other artists. It is something that few of them use it so it's something that I wanted to explore. And uh, in the same time I studied a little bit uh, how the skin uh, is created. This not means that I use it everything. I just collect it to have uh, uh, an idea. If I will be stuck in some point, I could just go here and uh, say, okay, this is a good idea. Because nature, you know, is full of incredible designs and colors and ideas to follow. And um, scaly skin. Scaly skin is something that I wanted to put, but I didn't want to cover all the character just to have some something where your eyes can rest when you see the overall composition. And to put the scaly skin somehow, I have this like a starting point, the creator of the Black Lagoon. And uh, this is a family costume. Everyone knows, I guess. And uh, it is interesting how they put the various scales following some kind of form in it. Since I wanted to do not a blobby uh, human body, but something more, uh, you know, with muscles and some bones, just to have something more, you know, uh, interesting to look, I just think that. Uh, the skates can follow somehow some muscle as something that I create beneath. So this is, was uh, crucial to to have this kind of mindset to bear when I I will sculpt, sculpt the, the details. So uh, after that, uh, uh, I usually try to figure out things just with my pen, with a big pen, doing very rough sketches without uh, caring to erase lines or something like that. I'm just exploring. Uh, it's a bit random. Uh, actually, I made it tr uh, 
together with the scout together. And, uh, but this was made uh, absolutely before I started because I wanted to figure out how the, the final piece would look uh, in various you know, point of view. Because my idea since the beginning uh, was to have a good render for, for a station or whatever, but also to have a physical statue in my hand. So to do that, I have to take in consideration uh, various things, the balance, the, the weight, and also the thickness of the various parts. This is something that uh, I learned a lot uh, during my day basic work with the toys, because we have a 3D printer inside and we use it a lot to, to check if everything is correct uh, and it's ready for production. And uh, after these sketches, I just found, I, I'm looking for overall shapes and, all, and uh, also for to have a different pose compared to the one I saw here and there. Uh, according to the, the description of the author, uh, the front um, arms has to be posed in this way, and he has to be sitting. But I wanted to do something more uh, dynamic, so I just decided to have the front uh, arms grabbing the, the, the hands grabbing the, the base and somehow and the pose is looking more like a spider-man or a gargoyle or something a little bit different and after this i decided that the shapes could be interesting i just made another sketch uh, all these sketches was made during my free time in the in the office so i i just uh, don't want to be too precise I just wanted to see the, the measure forms. So the head, the body in this position, somehow the tentacles and the wings that they are another big thing on uh, this character. And uh, from this sketch, after one day or two, I discovered that I didn't like it. I, I, I found it so already seen something more. The, the overall shape is too compact. I'd like to have more uh, dynamics. So the next step was this, and this is already really close to the end, uh, the end design I found. And what I really changed here is the shape of the head as more uh, detail. I just decided to put some eyes. And uh, I also love this, uh, I think it's called funnel. I don't know if the oct octopus use it for some kind of reading, but uh, putting elements like this can uh, force uh, someone to interpret it, the different interpretation. Are these the eyes or not? Sometimes uh, if you look at in some uh, lightning, they look like the eyes. So it's interesting to have something that's not so precise, so, you know, more vague. And uh, the other work I did here is to um, the synthesis of the shapes are already here. Uh, I, I just try to uh, imagine the shape of the of the, the wings to be not so common. And uh, at this point, I also decide to have the wings a mix between uh, human. Uh, that like uh, and also have the tentacles in somehow inside the, the, the wings. And uh, we will see in 3D how uh, I get it. And uh, the other step is uh, just put some color over it because uh, I already decided the color palette looking at this, uh, this one here. Uh, I just changed one color, this is the green on the on the body of the of the Cthulhu because it was important to keep a little bit of consistency from the description of the author. But the orange was present. The um, also the head you, you see in not not here but in this in the final version of the character is similar to this color, brownish color, something that is more you know a little bit different from the rest. And so it can pop out somehow. And uh, yes, then I put 
just some effects uh, easily, very easily, just to give him some fish look uh, um, more shiny, just something more, you know, effective. And uh, some of this uh, process, I did, uh, I did some of the details during the modeling because I always draw, uh, draw while I'm modeling because I found during the modeling process some problem and uh, some ideas. So it's easier to me just to sketch it uh, with the pen, big uh, in whatever. And uh, yes. So, so you're always using, are you always using a ballpoint pen when you're sketching like this? Or do you? Yes. That's your, that's your uh, go to? Yeah, yeah, I love uh, the feeling because, yeah. um, and it is also the, the paper is not a clean new paper, you know, it's the back of a photocopy, uh, something that I can throw away. Because uh, my idea is to have uh, uh, the concepting idea uh, disposable in every time, in every single time. I, I don't want to have uh, something, you know, expensive, something that I believe too much to be serious. I just love to have everything sketchy and uh, I can show away in every time because it can be difficult when you are, when you work too much on a thing, then if you find something wrong, it's difficult to throw it away. But if you keep everything uh, messy somehow and uh, low quality, maybe it's easier to change that your idea and discover new thing. That's why I, I try to do this. And uh, okay, this is the starting point. I usually uh, do when I when it comes to pose, I usually use this guy here that I made uh, millions of years ago. It's uh, a base mannequin. I just skin it with 3ds Max, and I use it to find uh, uh, poses like anyone can imagine. I find it useful when uh, the pose is not clear in my mind because maybe it's clear in the front, but I don't know what's going on uh, in the other views. And it, and it's very easy to add new keyframes and uh, you know move between keyframes to find the, the right position. But you can do the same also in ZBrush, to be honest. It's only a matter to invest kinem kinematic, I don't know, the, the IK, you know? The AK helps a lot when you have to move something and everything else is responding accordingly. So sometimes when I just, you know, I'm sketching a pose, uh, I find it is a little bit easier. Anyway, the, the final mesh is very messy, it's very low poly, so I can really build whatever I want here without caring too much to topology and everything that is final. This is not final, this is just a sketch. I just put some muscles, just some base. Uh, what I did here is to isolate some piece that is very useful to have uh, separated by polygroups because you maybe have to sculpt in some places that are hidden by other pieces of the mesh. So if you plan before uh, something like this, it's very easy to, you know, to isolate the points where you are focused on the modern face. And then uh, what I did here is another step, but it's very simple because everything I put, it's uh, dynamesh or uh, even uh, just, uh, you know, uh, a sphere. I just put a sphere inside uh, the project and then I use the move tool just the move tool because in this phase I'm looking for the shape and uh, one of the best improvement in one of the last uh are just there yeah. Yeah. yeah is this guy here this is one of the things that everyone should know maybe everyone knows I I know it the, the importance the, of uh, the you know the silhouette when you are especially creating something from scratch. But when you have here, it's another thing because uh, the, the eye <laughs> always uh, go uh, automatically to, to check what is it or what is not. And in this case, because I'm building a statue that you uh, is supposed to be seen from every angle, 
it is uh, something that it helps to map a very lot to to see if uh, the forms are clear if, if they are interesting and so on in this case i just uh okay i put a lot of things here just to figure out how the tentacles could flow then i change it a bit because in every step i leave the work and uh, i'll let him stay for one day or two since i have another work i can do it and i'm forced to do it but it's good because when you uh take a look after one day or two you have a fresh eye so you can evaluate something that you never seen before so uh here yeah, i decide for a single for example this is one of the big decision for the design is to have a single pentacle like an elephant in front of the character and from this decision decision i just uh continue the sculpting of the face like this so it was a decision that very important for the design because the tentacles are one of the things that is more uh, characteristic of, uh, of the character and uh, after that the the difficult uh, task was to imagine the, the the wings so I just uh, thought that uh, maybe the structure would be enough to have just a, a just uh, a, a first glimpse of what it would be uh, of course from uh, inside the structure had to be the membrane because in the description of Lovecraft, the, the wings has to be long, has to be long as, uh, until the, the base. So he had to touch the pedestal and they have to be membrane-like. So I plan to do the membrane inside of the structure, but everything is built one piece on another. The only uh, things I decided and we did not change it is the, is the, the pose at the spawning. The rest is only exploration. Um, let's load it. Another progress. Yeah, you're, you're pretty much sketching in 3D, right? At yeah, point. exactly. It, it's like when I use the pen. <laughs> it's more or less the same thing. So I do this all the time, when, especially when I don't have a proper concept art follow without you know i don't have to think too much if i have a concept art but when you are creating uh mostly in 3d you have to go you know one step or another from another and uh, i usually use uh, the clay polish tool as a modeling tool not to finish the, the piece this one for example is a, a merged version of uh, the character after a while and the measure version with the clay polish applied let me uh, see better if there are something not right with the basic shapes the basic uh, you know uh, planes of the sculpture so i i strongly suggest to use the clay polish as a checking tool also so do you just run it or do you also take advantage of the masking? Because I see you've got the white and the black in here. Are you using the mask that's in clay polish as well and filling it? Yeah, yeah. in this case, uh, I also played a bit with the colors and I used the, the ready placed mask from the clay polish because it can create also interesting, uh, you know, results. And uh, yes, this is basically uh, from the mask, the clay polish used to to crease the, the shapes, you know? Yeah, would it be possible to show it? Yeah, run it yeah, on yeah. this so they can see it? Yeah, yeah. Just run uh, the If you want, yes, uh, I have. Oh, uh, the first, let me yeah. first tell about the membrane that is sure. sketchy as the other pieces. And if you are uh, thinking about how I create it, it's very simple. I just clone one of the, the central part of the wings. I just made a clone. And this is one is this one and uh, i dynamic it and then i just made a mask i can show you if you want like this i just divided a bit i create a dynamic version and just using a 
simple mess here where I wanted to extract manually the membrane and I just move it simple like this. And since I have the other structure present, I just made it, uh, uh, you know, coincident with the, the other parts. Now there are too many things together in the screen, but you, I think you can understand well mm -hmm. what I mean. Yeah. So also this will be not the last version of the membrane, but this is something that I used to see how much of the character I can see when I rotate how much of the character is hidden by the wings. And uh, doing this with few minutes, I, I already see a problem. And if I did it uh, as a, I know uh, now I, I have to do the, the membrane, I will do already with, I don't know, low poly version, then I do the, no. It's better to, to try with the fastest way possible to spot the errors or spot the problems. So now it's easy to me to just moving uh, all the things to find the right position of the wings because this is not good. It's a, you can see here, it's a little bit messy, a little covering too much, but I wanted to show uh, the, the body of the creator as much as I can. And this is a point. And another thing you told me is, uh, yes, I just used to merge the character only once and in the merged one I just use a dynamesh and then with the clay polish there is this process of cleaning the shape now in this case maybe it's not working as I expected because it's too dense but if it's not dense you can see uh, better than the various planes how intersect each other and uh, it's a good way to see the initial uh, you know foundation of the sculpture hey, can you inverse the mask real quick so they can see that too you want to see the mask here yeah. yeah there you go yeah yes this so, is the mask yeah just in case people weren't aware there's actually a mask happening when you clay polish. ah yes if i did invert and try to sculpt over it i, I would you uh, cause this strange effect because there is a mask active and not visible, used by the clay polish tool. Even if some time can be also creative. Yeah, and, and, and a fun fact for everybody, that little polish button in Dynamesh, this is what it's using. It's using this clay polish. So if you turn that on by default, this is what it's using uh, and the settings in there. Fun filled fact. I also made a lot of different renders when it comes to checking my model. For example, this is okay, final renders, various kind, but inside here, I, this is the result rendering. This rendering was made in Keyshot, and maybe I made this render after this pass, okay? So I was uh, here. And I decided already to do a render because I have the the key shot bridge here in in ZBrush, so it's a matter of a click. And I have uh, the vertex color ready, and uh, just tweaking a little bit the illumination. This is not a fi final render, but he has the illumination with another in another uh, you know application. You can spot errors also in this way. And another thing I can suggest to do for everyone is to take picture on every step. If you work during the night, as happened to me always, at the end, take some time to make some kind of images like this, because the day after you can see them like an art direction of yourself. It's like, uh, no, uh, escaping from yourself, seeing from another point of view. And every time you can do, you can change point of view, helps a lot to spot errors and to improve your model. If, especially if you're working alone, some many times I, I do this uh, alone without anyone tell me, you know, advices. Only in the office, I, I get some uh, good, uh, you know, criticism. By, but sometimes you have to do it yourself. So the best thing you can do is change it, it's changing the way you look at your uh, 3D model. 
and I I found that the 2D representation has uh, this magic. I don't know why, but uh, in 3D you see too many things. But in 2D you can focus on uh, many uh, more, uh, uh, you know, simple but important things. This is my experience. All right, then. So uh, let's go forward to another version. Okay, this version is a little bit. Let me just. You can see from the shape that is already more visible and more um, readable. You can see the shape more easily uh, while I I go around the model because I already changed the, the shape of the of the wings. I changed the shape without any fear because I the, the hours of work was one minute, two minutes to do it. So moving this, I also plan how the wings have to meet the, the back of this guy. And uh, I tried this solution that is to some kind to additional arms. So the additional arms will uh, bend like, uh, uh, you know, sometimes the wings comes from the finger of the, the animal. And uh, in this case, I wanted just to be the finger become tentacles so it's uh, alien somehow everything i leave uh, here like a human was uh, completely distorted in the wings and so the wings will grab but it's not only they are not only touching the pedestal but they are actually grabbing light in the front and this make all the situation more uh, interesting to me it's look like re really uh, have uh, something moving, even if it's a static one. And also in this case, I also use some noise uh, from ZBrush. I just apply the surface noise you can find here and just play it a little bit just to add something more interesting to see, like a final statue, you know. And also in this case, I can spot, uh, for example, the the knee structure, the bone underneath, some uh, membrane coming out here. It was more, uh, it is more readable to me, even if I did it. But uh, when this kind of thing is working, al also this synthesis on uh, the, the various uh, fingers, I want it to be more, you know, compact to have uh, the details flowing uh, and concentrating here. And this is uh, another step. Uh, let's go directly to the final because uh, we can ask me later if you want some kind of demo about uh, some of the details you see here. But basically, let me just hide this one. This is the final one, comes directly from the other you see. I change it, I think, a little bit uh, here and there, but if you see, it's not so different. It, because I was sure that this is uh, the, the thing that was working well. So I just planned to, to go here in the details, and uh, I just use it, um, this brush here. This brush here, I just bought from internet by Pablo Munoz Comets, but it is, is another version of Dumb Standard. I just bought some years ago, and now I use a lot. I, I don't remember, actually, the difference between this and the Dumb Standard, but it's I use it like, uh, like him, like it. So uh, very simple to use. And uh, the other brush I use usually is uh, the Clay Build Up because it's very easy to, you know, to see shapes uh, and to make them uh, flowing according to your movement, because it's important. It's like when you sketch something with the, with the pencil, you need to see also the direction. At, at least I need to see. Then uh, you can just make them go away with smoothing or just using another subdivision. Subdivision level, uh, really important when you scrub it is not uh, so uh, easy to understand because it's a matter of practice in, in this case for for instance 
this mesh here is already a uh, zero mesh because uh, uh, at one point uh, I just use uh, a simple sphere and I use DynaMesh to sculpt freely the main shapes. When it comes to micro details, I usually uh, transform the mesh in uh, something more uh, usable for the rendering. So I just use the zero mesh here. Yeah. Uh, well, in geometry, zero mesh. And uh, I also create some polygroups, just masking the parts of the original model. And the polygroups helps you to get to get some, you know, some edges, some uh, loops, and to have more, uh, you know, control to the final mesh, zero mesh creates. And uh, I just needed to put it here and there. Then I deleted all all the part I don't need it because it was covered by the other mesh. And once you have this, you can easily also generate UV with UV master. I don't know, Paul, if I have to go in deep uh, about this sort of uh, technical stuff, but I think- Well, you're using you're using UV Master because your end target goal is Marmoset, right? In this yes, particular yes. workflow. So he, you're trying to get it into Marmoset. So that's why he's yes. remeshing and using- and If you have the UV, you can easily translate your color information as a texture from ZBrush. And I also export the normal map and uh, use, for example, Substance Painter to add uh, uh, other channels. You know, there is uh, channels like uh, Roughness, uh, Substance Space Scattering. I just use Roughness, so the level of uh, the slimy look uh, on the surface. I mean, this kind of stuff here. The roughness was uh, just tuned in uh, substance, and the final render was in uh, <clears throat> Marmoset toolback. So you need uh, the UV mapping to do this uh, for the final rendering. And so for this particular easy. project, you just used UV Master for all your UVs. Yes, yes. Sometimes I tweak a little bit, but sometimes you know, I don't need it. Let's clone this one so people can. Uh, no, sorry, work on clone. This is how it looks. And it was done by ZBrush. I didn't have uh, any reason to modify this. O of course, I um, already prepare different parts of the model in according to the level of detail I wanted. So usually the head uh, has the most important part when you do the rendering. Uh, you always see this part as uh, you know something that, that your eyes try to explore in the first place. So it was a single piece, and uh, the other maybe like the back on the the wings has mm -hmm. a different. Uh, or just your back in general. You got a lot of detail in that back. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. This and is, I think uh, a, a good point about your head to point out is the fact that you didn't close the bottom off actually yeah. better for the UV because then it just needs exactly. to do that instead of yeah. trying to figure out topology that's there that's really not going to be seen or used so it's a good little tip he's sharing with you all getting yeah. rid of that bottom half has actually been beneficial for the UV as well yes usually when you when you do uh the uh remesher remeshing pro, uh, process you get a closed maybe you know a closed shape but if you already have an idea what you are doing, and uh, you see there are something that you will never see, it's not, uh, uh, there's no use to have this uh, uh, as a UV space. It's a waste of space in the UV mapping. So it's better to eliminate uh, and to save also resources for the rendering. And uh, sometimes I do, sometimes not. This is was made because the unwrapping uh, automatic uh, process of the UV master uh, is easier. If you have close surface, you have to to help the ZD mesher to, to find the scene 
to have you know, the, the unwrapped process. But if you have open parts, he can do the job quite well without any interaction. Also for the body, for example, we have many different pieces. Uh, let's work on clone another time and uh, I didn't use it, so I didn't detach it, these parts, because it was already good to me. It's not a good uh, UV mapping, to be honest, if you plan to use it for production, but for a pre-visualization of a render where everything is you're in control, in your control is more than enough. It's, it's perfect, especially for, for, you know, when you do pre-visualization for things, uh, when you do concept art in 3D, this is uh, really, really, really helpful. And you ended up 3D printing him, right? I saw a picture of you. Yeah. Another so step I did was uh, exporting everything for mm -hmm. the 3D printer. And for that, uh, I can, all right. I just used the um, 3D print hub uh, module here in the Z plugin. We use this all the time when uh, I am in the office to generate prototype for our toys because we can choose the sides, the overall sides, even if uh, there are many pieces, they will be scaled accordingly. And uh, in this case, since I uh, already have the poly paint in it i just use the vrml format to get a stl file but with the, the color information well the print was with the print was you printed on, on one of the color printers the yes or... uh, we use a stratasys uh, j750 okay. polyjet yeah yeah okay. yeah it's uh color jet. And the good thing about this is the, the effect was impressive, even to me. I didn't expect so much because the color in the printer is not uh, over the, the statue, but it's inside. So it's uh, part of the material is blended, but it's not in the surface. It comes from inside. So when a piece is small like this, it's uh, 14 cm big. I, I just choose the, the smaller version to, to save a little bit of, you know, money because we used to, to print this in, at the office when we have uh, some extra material that has a living time. So when they are about to expire, we just print something just to, you know, to save some material. And uh, in this case, you can see translucency and uh, things like that, that it is impossible if you you know, paint over uh, a resin, for example, because uh, the translucency will be blocked by the color. Maybe is it, if it, uh, is it uh, thin enough, you can get something similar, but this is truly amazing because you can see it looks like, uh, uh, you see here, I didn't expect this kind of effect. The light uh, uh, traveled through the model in an incredible way. I also did another version that is more similar to the one described in the book, because in the book they uh, locked up talk also about uh, a statue. Uh, it's a part of the story. But yes, uh, you're not. Are you selling these? Someone was asking what uh, how the much moment, is the price for the print. Uh, at the moment, this is this was made only for to me and uh, some colleague that we just. Uh, we have fun of uh, Lovecraft and we did it only for this. But I I think I will uh, I will do some production of, of a racing kit maybe in the future. But uh, it's something that I have to plan uh, very well because you know I don't want to uh, disappoint anyone. So I have to have the right time to plan it and to get things done uh, well. Yes, but maybe we will do something more big, maybe not only uh, 14. How, how tall was that? Was that about what? What was that, about 15 centimeters tall, the print? This one is 14 centimeters, uh, yeah. Yeah, 14 but centimeters. But I, I, I planned something like 60. 60? 16. 
I'm 16. And they yeah, said yeah. 60. I'm like, not too much. <laughs> not, not, not human scale. Not human scale. <laughs> like 60. 60 yeah. seconds. Oh boy. Now we're talking. <laughs> you can enter <laughs> inside the, the mall. No, it's good. You can make it as a monument outside the, your house or something. <laughs> enter. <laughs> Halloween is coming up. Let's go. <laughs> oh, this, this is a. Uh... Uh, you make me think about one thing that I didn't mention about uh, when you check uh, if your model is okay or not. Yeah, uh, I use it a lot also um, together with eShot, another way to you know to check if your model is okay. I use also VR. Uh, I just export from here an FBX with color information and I load it in uh, in a free program. It's Adobe Medium in uh, VR. If I don't use uh, the VR software to model, but I really love to see what I did in ZBrush there because you have the stereoscopic vision, you have the dimension, and you can actually uh, scale the character more than 60 centimeters. You can do it uh, really giant. Hey, but hey. Uh, I learned how much is important uh, the dimension of the, the, the final piece can be uh important when you plan the, the different proportion that's why you have miniature with the you know stylus arms legs because if you do something like human correct or correct human and you skate too much uh it, when it comes to be uh too small it looks wrong somehow so it is important to have a check and i use it a lot when uh, i know that i have to print something it's a, a double check I suggest everyone, if you, if you can, to try because it's very also exciting and pleasing to do it. Um, I don't know if we have some extra time to talk about yeah, yeah. the details. Yeah, you wanted to show your, some of your masking techniques as well. All right. That you used. Let's you, you're, go. You're, only, you're only an hour in. All right. Uh, I just want to say that for detailing phase, uh, uh, like I said before, I just use uh, very few brushes like this one in various uh, different intensity, but usually I go very low this intensity. Pablo's, this is Pablo's brush? Yes, this is the Pablo's, but you can choose, yeah. I think, also the Dev Stardell as well. Yeah, one and... of the big differences between his and the Dame standards, he's using Displace as the brush mm. type and Damon Sanders using the standard brush brush type. So right. they're, they're different oh. the way those two brushes are actually even going to work too. All right. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. And uh, another thing, uh, let me show you this detail. Maybe it's interesting with the ambient occlusion. Uh, the real time ambient occlusion can, you sh can show better the, the surface detailing that is resembling a little bit what I learned when I and I just study a little bit this kind of shapes here. It's not identical, but uh, for example, you can see some of the movement you see in the flash here. In this, I just try to mimic in some places. And some other places are more uh, just bone looking piece. Uh, other places are just a piece of mesh. I decided to put to add some slimy looking detail here and there. Uh, but the important thing here is to plan the flow or the wrinkles to have something that uh, has a, you know, a point of convergency when you look at this. And uh, also uh, decide where to put details and where to rest a bit. So. The, um, the scales, for example, was made by hand, and uh, I, sorry, God, let me ah, close this one. It was made just starting from a lower intensity, a lower subdivision, so, so uh, using, for example, the knife tool just to, to put some landmarks. Because ah, I also use the MOF target. Uh, function to eliminate errors of uh, or uh, just uh, you know make details less hard to see and it's a good thing to to use it's different from smoothing it's something that really raised what we did 
and it's more easy to use it uh, than having a frame. Anything else, I think. Anyway, anyway, you have to plan a little bit where to put the, the wrinkles or the, the scales. When you find a good pattern that can be suggested by nature or the other artist's work, it's your choice. You have to understand what is uh, over other things. Um, I mean, uh, the layering the stuff from the various shapes. And uh, I just use the, the same brush with sub and add to have this uh, this kind of uh, of movement here. I'm heading on the top and carving on one side. I also could use the gravity in some piece, in some places, some areas, just to have uh, automatically uh, see the mesh go down. But sometimes, since it's related to the, the view of the camera, can be tricky sometimes. So I learned to do it by myself with patience. And uh, doing like this, it's more under control to me. And I just make the same thing, not only in, in one piece, but try to have this um, uh, sketchy way to do just for every place, just a little bit here, a little bit there, but not concentrate too much on a single area. It can be difficult. To, to make everything consistent. So very easy, like this. Then I can just use the tape polish with a small intensity, just to make some of some pieces of the surface more more uh, clean, if I want. Because the, the idea here was to have uh, something more, uh, you know, clean and uh, uh, wrinkles where the, the scale is not present. This can be more uh, visible and appealing. Then the color did the second, uh, the second pass. I mean, I mean. Anyway. Do it like this uh, and using also a uh, standard brush, for example, to to grow a bit the edge and making more a little bit uh, of uh, movement to make it more organic. The let things to you know to accept. And if you play with every little piece at the end it's relaxing and you obtain something that is unique i guess and uh, of course i made veins and muscles before i did this kind of work of the scale and the wrinkles just remember to have a strong foundation before the same is for the hands for example i just made very visible uh, bone landmarks before i did every single minor details. That's why I was checking with clay polish function. So this hour I made the scale and I just want to show you how I made this uh, strange skin effect. Uh, to do that, I just uh, create from a plane. I just made it Polymer 3D, subdivided, and just use the cable up to create a, a blobby shape. You can do it in many ways, but this is only a demo for you. And I want it to be pretty isolated from, from the rest of the of the plane here. Then I just use grab doc to create an alpha. It's easy like this to create alpha in ZBrush. And uh, then 
you can always tweak a little bit the alpha. Usually you put some uh, radial fade to have uh, some kind of fade out. You can maximize the level if you need. And then I usually uh, check for layer brush and I load this texture on the layer brush. Let's back to this guy. Let's take another version with less detail. Let's say here. And let's try it. I just used the color spray. It's a matter of tweaking the intensity now. But if you see, you just start to create an underlying skin effect that can be modified in various ways. Uh, let's say a bit intensity. And this is one of the way I made. Of course, it's different because maybe I, I just made a different kind of, uh, of shape when I extract it. You can use it in a singular way. You can even use the mock target to have a common uh, starting point on the surface, and this can be useful. Uh, more target. In this way, you can have this kind of uh, clean uh, layering effect. And yes. I just tweaked some parameters, but you know, depending on what you are doing, it's something that becomes uh, really uh, it's a natural, very, very quite quickly. And uh, I don't think I use it something different because you see the main blocks here was made in the same uh, kind of process. This kind of details here was made maybe using uh, always the the same uh, knife brush, and in the end I just wanted to say about the, the poly paint that uh, I used a lot uh, the masking. The first step was using uh, without a mask just uh, the the standard brush with uh, some color spray and two base color that could be green, two kind of green, very low intensity, very dark green, just a bit of blue. And uh, I just uh, paint it from the far distance just to have uh, a visible effect. And when you have uh, the base, you can uh, go ahead and put minor details that you can see better if I see the black color, maybe. This is the effect of the spray. And all the other effects, like uh, in the cavity, is obviously using the cavity mask. Uh, masking. Cavity mask. And I don't know if it's visible with this. Uh, yes, it's visible. You can invert the mask and paint on the cavity and whatever you want. Another thing I use a lot is the mask by Pixel Valley that gives you some pretty random effect, I would say, but uh, it's always very organic and that's a lot to paint. And it's a mix of uh, this process. I also use the ambient occlusion, the one that comes in the Z plugin. Uh, and the ambient occlusion here is very, very, very efficient. And uh, you can use it also with more than one mesh to be considered for the generation. So different two tools gives you different uh, ambient occlusion accordingly. And I think that's all. I don't know if you have some questions about Yeah, so for the part when you were talking about the print, how many pieces did it end up being when you sent it to the printer? 
Uh, our printer is able to print uh, one single piece because uh, the final piece is completely covered by the support. support. Yeah. So in this case, I just uh, leave it as, as a single piece. I just uh, dynamized everything. I did a uh, uh, decimation of the mesh, but keeping the UV, then the poly paint, because you can also keep the poly paint while you have uh, the decimation process. And once uh, we have the okay from the software, there are you know, you know, uh, small points or uh, hole in the mesh. It's good to work. It was really easy to do it. So one single piece. Yeah, it's nice to just break away that support material on that. You can printer. also have a look here. This there is you the go. Final here, hold on. We can let me put your uh, webcam bigger. There you yeah. go. Yeah, your webcam's full screen now. Let me have some light here. Maybe you can see better. You can see it's pretty small. Some part was uh, at limit, like uh, the details here under the the wings but everything comes out very really well. And it was not even polished with, uh, you know, it mm -hmm. was only polished with uh, the liquid, uh, I don't know the name in English, but you know, when you emerge in the liquid for one day, yeah, it, it uh, abrasive, uh, something like this. And this is the result. Yeah, it turned out awesome. Yeah, it was incredible. I was impressed because I didn't expect it. We, we used to print, uh, you know, solid colors for toys and uh, maybe extremely big print with no details at all. They are thin. <laughs> so it's, well, this is the, the first time we use it for something so complex. And, and it's incredible how many details, uh, also the dynamic, the decimator was incredible because it took in account the various, you know, blending between colors. I don't know how. <laughs> it, it's incredible. So did you end up closing the head off when you did the print? Because you had it open. Yes. When I when I merged everything together, I used the Dynamesh oh. where, to be sure that sure. everything was uh, melted and covered. You know, there is a whole uh, closing automatically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it was important to do this. Uh, I love too yeah. that you you made the stand to part of the piece too. It tells the story. It's it's not just a stand. It feels like it's even more of him as well. So it's a beautiful piece. Congratulations! It's thank you. Awesome, really great piece. I know when we were talking about printing, a lot of people said you should sell. They would buy some. So you've got okay. some sales here. If you decide, we, to we will it. try. We will try to do our best to have uh, some some um, praising, maybe hand-painted version soon. I will do my best to do it. Or at least I, if I can find a way, I will sell the STL so everyone can yeah, enjoy yeah. his piece somehow. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Do you, um, so the process you were talking about when you were rendering, in the very is that something you're doing in all your pieces? You're rendering really early on in your designing you're throwing it in like a key shot and rendering out is that something you do with all your pieces the, depending on the um, you know how important it is but yes because it's simple it's simple like this i just go here mm -hmm. i say you know external render click here and uh, maybe now it's uh, something i <laughs> didn't have to do but anyway it's very fast, especially when you have the blocking because it's so, uh, you know, no body stuff after all. I just use it to, to see how the light uh, work inside the various shapes. So here, here we go. It's a matter of no moment. I, I don't even launch the actual render. I just leave it like here. here. And I wait for some minutes. I, I don't care if there is some noise, you know, or something like this. I just caring about the overall shape uh, and spotting the errors on this. 
also here I can change the color very quickly, uh, materials, you know. Mm -hmm. But I do the same also in ZBrush, but you know, when you have just one light, uh, it's something more uh, uh, efficient when it's got. But if you have uh, to look at everything, maybe uh, also because I have to deal with this translucency that it was important in the in the, the wings. And uh, I just now delete this is everything merged. But in, I don't know, yes, it's merged. But another piece, I just made one side and I used dynamic uh, subdivision to get the thickness. The, the thickness, yes. So it was also always in preview mode. And uh, when I exported, to check if the translucency was right, uh, was really easy to, to find the right thickness in the end. Uh, so yeah. you were sculpting all the details when it was just a single plane. I know. Yeah. And then no, you... no, actually, uh, I continued to sculpt after I applied. You did. Thickness. Yeah. When I found the right thickness, I decided to, to sculpt also the other side. I have. They are a little bit different. Also, the color are different because. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I have these two kind of uh, surface. Even if in the beginning it uh, was the same color, but it was more lazy, you know. So I just found also this kind of render helps a lot. Very not uh, pleasing to the eyes, but you know, everything can help uh, spot. Yeah, I so, think you made a great point of taking some two D images when you're done, and then look at them the next day. Yeah, because yeah, that's yeah. I think it's a critical thing all for artists, all of us to be able to catch things that are off. That's a great, that was a great tip um, to give yeah. everybody. That was a great idea. You have to be the, you know, art the art director of yourself. yourself. Yeah, yeah, the art director of yourself, which <laughs> isn't the easiest thing to do sometimes. Yes, yeah. it's complex if you use uh, such words, you know, but yeah. uh, you have to change your point of view. It's the only thing that matter, I think. Well, this was really great. I really appreciate you taking time and showing your whole pipeline on this and how you where you started and how you got them and showed some of the tricks that you did. Um, I don't know if anybody's got any other questions. Nails the time to ask those questions so we can give them to Giorgio. So, but uh, thank you again for for um, joining us. It's, it was really awesome to have you pleasure. here with us. Yeah, it was really great. I know it's late there for you too, so. I appreciate you uh, taking the time uh, in your evening to be with us. There's a couple yeah, of thank yous coming through mm -hmm. for us. So, uh, go ahead. Oh, just uh, spotting here, I didn't talk too much about this kind of uh, strange anatomy, recalling a little bit the pectorals in the front. I use it here to, to find a sense of uh, the arms he has uh, in the back. And this is the kind of a position I'm uh, talking about the scales using uh, this guy as a reference. Oh, sorry, not this. Uh, this guy here. What is wrong? What is Let's see. Oops. This guy. Oh, yes. I just tried uh, to follow this movement, but on my surfaces. So, since we have some muscles, I just try to follow the shape I built it before. And it's more important to do this than and uh, not use maybe custom alpha that can be messy sometimes. I see sometimes many details on character, but they are missing the, the shapes behind. No. Uh, this isn't just a suggestion. Yeah. It was awesome. Like I said, that back that you did, it's really gorgeous. This is a single piece <laughs> to do this. Just to have some, you know, breaking the shape when you see from the side. Right. And some light. What one of the things that you can spot with the proper renderings. Yeah. 
Okay. Well, thank you uh, again. I appreciate you taking the time with us to uh, walk through all of this with us. It's uh, been a lot of fun. Um, I know a lot of people are joining these streams and enjoying this. There's more coming, so you definitely want to uh, look at our schedule. We have uh, another one coming up uh, for all of you that's coming. So we have in a couple weeks. We don't have one next Tuesday, but we do have another one coming up in two weeks. Uh, it's going to be with Mike Thompson, uh, and it's going to be very much showing how he uses ZBrush to actually create a 2D, almost like Giorgio, when you were doing, you know, talking about that Photoshop plugin, getting a final 2D image. Yeah. So um, Mike's stream is going to be really a little bit about that too, and working with clients that he has, and mm -hmm. how does he integrate ZBrush into his uh, 2D pipeline at the end? So he's starting a lot in ZBrush actually, and then he can he ends up in Painter, and does a lot of stuff in Painter as well. So that'll that'll be in two weeks, and again I'll put a link in the chats because if you enjoyed uh, enjoyed this stream, there's more coming. So I'm going to put that in the chat for you all. Uh, that's a calendar. Uh, part for you and uh once again you've been watching a zebra central image breakdown and our special guests here Giorgio palamon b so thank you so much for being here with us and sharing your cthulhu child it's thank you great. guys it was great all right we'll see you all in the next stream everybody thanks for joining us uh have a great day bye bye